UK around the Houses Roundtable for near this. And the first thing I want to do is to thank Philip, Philip Hamby, who is a specialization specification specialist for the company Neolis. So thank you, Philip, for allowing us to do this. I tried to invite Philip to listen in, and this is what got my entire system completely <laughs> lost off my computer. So my apologies that we're starting a little late. So what are we going to look at today? Neolith set these up as conversations at home. The first idea is to find out how each of us is reacting to the current and the unfolding situation. So I'm going to ask you in turn to introduce yourselves. And then for each of you, just for the first five or ten minutes, let's explore that. How it's been for you in this current and unfolding, rapidly unfolding situation. Um, one of the things I've spotted is of course, all of our beautiful flowers. We can't visit this year in all the gardens and flower festivals. But a very lovely lady from the presenter from the BBC, I managed to see in person at very much the very last time that we had a physical meeting. And I attended a whole day conference in a flower nursery. And Arit Anderson said, Will to change is a renewable resource. I thought that's quite wonderful, the will to change, that human resource, and it's renewable. Each generation has another will to change. So this is a really happy and important note to start on. So how should I take it? Tim, you're at home. Uh, no, I'm not actually. I'm in my office because... Um... We have a small office that is walkable from our house um, so, and no one else is using it. So um, having done a risk assessment based on likelihood of, uh, so of uh, um, coming into close contact, I, we've decided to start using the office again, at least for myself and uh, Nimi. Because we have a four-year-old at home, uh, which makes working from home uh, quite challenging, um, <laughs> which we can maybe come on to. This is actually our office, so. so. Introduce yourself, Tim. So I'm Tim O'Callaghan. I'm a founding director of Nintim Architects. Um, we're a practice of six architectural staff um, and office manager in, in South East London. Uh, we've been going for about five, five years now. Um, so, I mean, it, we don't want to talk about Nintim Architects. We want to kind of talk about how we're responding to the situation. So we obviously uh, have been work all working from home. So we had to kind of very quickly adapt to that situation uh, what, eight or nine weeks ago. So having not really done it much before, we had to then set everyone up to work from home um, and um, adjust to the changing situation, which was kind of slightly reduced workload. All of our sites closed at least for a couple of weeks. Um, so it was all quite uh, changeable at the time. Um, and we've been kind of learning how to work from home. And I think we found it more challenging maybe than we first expected. We kind of started everyone working from home quite quickly and successfully. Um, but I think it was the, so the logistics of it was relatively straightforward in terms of technology and, and software and so on. But what became more difficult, which was maybe less expected was it sort of highlighted ways of working that we couldn't transfer um, and that we I think we've realized especially recently that the office relied so much on the kind of ad hoc and unplanned interactions within the office um, and with certain elements of work particularly have been very difficult um, or very challenging to kind of replicate um, particularly design phase design stages where so much happens kind of over looking over someone's shoulder or kind of while you're grabbing a coffee, you start talking about something or someone else in the office might kind of chip in with um, uh, views or kind of ideas. So we have found the, we have found the transition very difficult and it's highlighted maybe deficiencies in the way that we work or, or kind of ways in which we work that aren't transferable to working from home. So in general, it's been um, interesting, challenging, um, we're still working through it. Uh, I think we, we're going to have learned a lot. We're going to have changed a lot. 
Um, um, so yeah, it's been it's been very yeah, it's been a very interesting time. Um, evolving quickly situation. Um, yeah. yeah, Trevor, how's it been for you? And introduce yourself. Yes, of course. Uh, my name's Trevor McClymont, and I'm a real estate um, director for some twenty years. The London-based operation. I've, I've also started a a new entity called One Res Publica, which is involved in housing association advisory. And um, so that's my full-time role. I have a number of other um, um, seats, which I hold on a number of other boards, um, both uh, housing association and international so I'm fairly active in that sense. Um, in terms of working from home, um, it, and certainly during this period, it hasn't been a change for me. I have been working from home probably for the last five years. As a senior person in the company, I take that advantage. Um, so um, I'm quite used to the environment. Um, so during the last eight or nine weeks, it's not for me actually been a challenge. It's just been more the same. Uh, what I can say is that I found myself having to mentor other. Finally, Christopher. <laughs> Sorry, Trevor. Had you had you finished? No, I hadn't. No, I, I, I was just about to say that um, I've noticed in the last eight or nine weeks that I've had to mentor. Um, other colleagues. Um, Are you still with us, Trevor? Yes, I am. I, I can hear him, Liz. It's gone into a loop, I'm afraid. Trevor, hi. Yes, I can. I think we're losing you, Liz. Yeah, yeah I think it's you we're losing. Yeah, your your screen's buffering, Liz. Yes. Hello. Yes, are you here? I can hear you. Good. I was just saying, Liz, that um, I found myself in the last eight or nine weeks um, having to yeah. mentor, um, you know, both friends and colleagues who are finding it a challenge, and uh, that's been a little um, surreal. But I've enjoyed doing that, and um, mm. so. That, thing that I've noticed. The other thing that I've noticed in my particular field um, as real estate and engaging with all the various consultants, I'm able, I found in the last sort of six or seven weeks, um, to actually go a little, um, you know, um, to explore a little bit more about what I'm asking and what I'm receiving. So I've got more time to look at things um, with a much, um, you know, um, light a torch and, and to ask more um, in-depth uh, you know, sort of searching points and questions as opposed to just going with the flow because you know you don't have time we were working in the previous era so I found those two changes and I've enjoyed both thank you thank you and um, Alistair thanks Liz uh, so my name's Alistair Barr. I'm the founder and chair of Barr Gazettas Architects and Designers. We started uh, 26 years ago. We've got uh, thir 32 people working for us. Our, our project sectors include offices, public realm, retail, residential, and all of those different clients are always asking us the last eight weeks or so, what's going to happen next? So I'm really, de I'm really delighted to be to be asked on this round table and, and to hear what everyone's saying about that because it's it's the most important question in our office at the moment in terms of of how we're working it's been been an amazing thing really uh, monday that, that that monday we all left the office by by tuesday afternoon all all but uh, one person was working remotely lots of glitches along the way lots of technical glitches but we, we've been really lucky we have an amazing uh, office studio manager Gemma. And uh, she's arranged so many extracurricular things. So Monday morning meeting, we have design crits on the Monday morning. Every other lunchtime, there's the Bar Gazettas Cafe. 
and uh, on, on Tuesday nights, there's, there's cookery lessons. Uh, we, we've got a very multinational office, so, so different people demonstrate their favorite dish from, their, from the, the, the country they were born in. And then tonight, Friday night, we have an office pub quiz at five o'clock. So uh, there's, 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 in terms of us seeing each other, we're actually almost seeing each other more than we, we do in a normal office. You know, normally you'd be at meetings out on site or whatever. We see a lot of each other, albeit only on the screen. And I, I agree exactly with uh, Tim. You know, there's a whole lot of things that, that we're doing in a very productive way. It's those early concept design things which are tricky. As I say, we've always, for 26 years, had Monday morning crits. We pin the drawings up and we, and we talk about them. We get our pens out, draw over them, have the conversations. It's, it's just a bit more tricky, although, you know, as you know, on, on Zoom, you can draw over the drawings as well. We're getting used to that. So it's, it's pretty amazing what, what changes have happened, but it's those early design concept stages. For example, we, we have a 3D printer. We, we'd like to print a building out, hold it in our hands, get out a scalpel, carve a bit off. And I think the, the, the other thing I really miss is, is uh, when we're choosing finishes and materials, you know, we, we might be choosing tiles, tim timber, metal, you hold them in your hand, you put the two together, you look at them, you pass them around. That's, that's the bit we haven't conquered yet. Fantastic. So I picked out of this that you have a gem called Gemma, Alistair. Yes, very good. Yes. It's really important. And that Trevor is mentoring in a more surreal fashion, which is amazing. Uh, but I like your thought of lighting a torch. I thought that was really significant and thinking in more depth. Yes. having a chance to do that and uh tim you're in the office my goodness that must be very strange <laughs> a lonely position in an office your point about the family and the children and how difficult it is to have family and workplace in the same place and as we now move from our introductions into the meat of what we're doing I thought we'd start by just looking at that issue in terms of how we think homes might get designed in the future. I think you have had a little bit of a, a sort of angst thought about that when you've had to think, how do I juggle a four-year-old and getting anything done? So do you want to kick off on what a home could be like? Well, I mean, I think you're obviously, um, we're, you know, what what's happened? I think we talk. I mean, we've 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 we spoke briefly about the way that these kind of situations can accelerate change. And so the the issue of working from home, or the the idea of working from home, as something that happens more often, has kind of been accelerated by the situation. It's interesting to speculate what might have happened twenty years ago, or even ten years ago, um, that it, we wouldn't wouldn't you know it, for many carried on more or less as usual able to kind of carry on trading which wouldn't have been possible even five maybe five years ago so the technology's changed so sufficiently but the pandemic has kind of forced us to um accept and and learn it quicker so we've all learned how to use zoom or uh, equivalents uh recently um and i guess you know our, our experience is is that um we've had to learn how to manage and how to run a practice remotely um, and alistair the challenges that that brings in terms of designing and kind of collaborating. Um, I think, talking about the home, obviously people are going to be working from home. Um, one thing that we've discovered um, as a result of the, uh, you know, especially for our staff, you know, uh, the, the, the other concurrent problem that we have in London, especially, is the kind of very poor quality of the housing stock and the kind of housing crisis. So we're working with our staff who are quite often in very poor accommodation you know they might be trying to work from home from their bedroom because they don't have it even have a shared space to do it from um it, it within their their flat share um and you can imagine they're sharing with five other people all of whom are trying to work from home and the the setup there is just not conducive to to doing that so if the if companies long term if we are going to see a longer term shift to working from home which i think will happen because companies will want to relinquish the cost of some of their commercial office space, then the onus is then going to be put onto the uh, employees to provide space for them to work. So that brings lots of challenges in terms of, is it suitable, is it comfortable, is it the sort of 
position that you can work in for eight hours a day. Um, but also there's a big challenge because our housing stock is completely um, uh, unsuitable in, in many ways for, for, for them to do that. So um, there's lots of questions that come out of that. Do, you know, do, I think our housing policy has to change um, and our housing requirements have to change to take into account the fact that almost everyone is going to be working from home some of the time. So there's lots of interesting kind of out outcomes. Um, and then obviously it brings in, it's also challenging for different demographics. And as a, a kind of father of a young uh, four-year-old, it, it's a very different challenge working from home uh, in that situation. Um, so hence coming into the office when, 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 when possible. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it's not a level playing field, essentially, when people have to go and work from home. Um, and so it brings lots of social and uh, kind of individual challenges. Thank you. I, I made a comment to a, an international webinar, somebody saying, well, all the Silicon Valley people are working from home because I'd been sent an email about four or five weeks ago saying that people in Silicon Valley, a lot are homeless, even amongst the professionals. So I asked this guy who was actually from America, has his reaction been? And it is true, this is a big problem, working from home when you don't have adequate facilities or indeed if you don't have a home. So that's um, a little bit about housing. Um, that was, um, and again, Tim, it's your neck of the woods. You're very close to a lot of little suburban local high streets. And we were thinking that working from home, you're more likely to shop near a home. But the future of our high streets across the UK is a frighteningly quick evolving um, decline because of going online, uh, because rates have gone upwards, rents have gone upwards and the demand has gone downwards. I just wanted to say uh, another thing about working from home, do you think it would mean people be more likely to shop near at home? Would that be a, re a way of revitalising suburban <laughs> shops? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think possibly, and I think that what you might also see is um, more localised kind of um, rented workspaces or hot desking type places that um, if people are kind of being expected to work from home five days, you know, five days a week or even four or three days a week, then they might not want to actually be at their house to do that and might need another space to to kind of go. Because one thing, another thing about working from home is just the mental challenge of it. The space that you previously or normally use to relax and spend time with your family or, uh, or you know, kind of wind down, is now the same space in which you're having to work and have kind of maybe stressful situations. So there's a there's a psychological challenge and we've definitely seen that. Trevor, you you hinted at it. Some of uh, many of our employees have really really struggled mentally with the situation. Partly the overwhelming foreboding of the pandemic, but also the situation that they're in, definitely in their in either living alone or living with a in the flat share with people that they're, you know, that aren't their immediate family. So that's another 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 issue that is kind of um, something that we'll need to address. Um, but the idea you have of having another use on the high street, which is for people to go out of their home but work nearer to home, is a really interesting one. Trevor, I think we've talked about the possible reuse of buildings, and I wanted to get your sort of developer perspective on that, really. Um, and in particular, I know you've done one building in Brighton, which I think is really interesting. Yes. I hand over to you to pass this thought process a bit further down the line of what reuse we could have on high streets. Yes, of course. Um, I, as a developer, um, a lot of our energy, um, along with architects, I must say, um, is involved in, in thinking big, using our imaginations, trying to see what the future could look like. That's a very important aspect in dealing with the environment um, as, um, as we find it. Um, I think a lot of the challenges are at the moment being approached almost from an economic 
point of view. So everything is driven by value rather than trying to imagine what that space could turn into and what is required to make that happen. So um, you mentioned the high street. I'm, you know, you look at some of the, the stronger high streets up and down the country and they have a, you know, they have a, they have a form, um, they have a sense of ID and they are rooted in the local scene and setting. And that's quite important to have all three to make a high street or any local area, um, A, successful and B, sustainable. And you only have to look, to look across Europe to look at how markets, say food markets in France, Spain or Italy, how they survive. Um, I'm quite near to London Bridge, so we visit that market there quite regular. And it's an absolute you know, eye-opener to see how people are drawn, how people interact, how people use it. And you can see that it's not just a market selling you know, low-value items. Um, that's, a, that's a good expression to use. But they sell a range of projects, a range of quality, some of the best you know, fish and fruit, uh, vegetables can be found in these places. Um, so I go back to high streets as they're in a transition and we as developers and architects have just not found a suitable alternative um, place with shops at the moment. Um, I don't accept that the internet is the cause of the high street um, declining. It's certainly an alternative. And when you look at it from a macro perspective, it, it, it's, it's still growing, but it has its own issues. You know, just to highlight one, I watch my younger children who are sort of early 20s, shop online, yes. Uh, the rate of return of goods is quite high. You know, and I've, you know, while that's part and parcel of shopping online, it, it's, it shows you that the online shopping experience is, is not as well formed um, as is um, suggested. Um, so I think there's a place for the high street. I think there's a place for shops. I think we have a lot to learn from some of our more successful high streets, more um, sustainable locations up and down the country. And we should be drawing lessons from that and then using our imaginations to, to kind of put that um, into play in the high street. And then, of course, the rest will follow. Sounds good. Alistair, you're uh, very close, well, not at home at the moment, but when you're in your office, very close to one of the most prestigious shopping streets in London, most prestigious in the world, in Regent Street, which is another kind of high street at the very far end of the, the, the other end of the scale. Yeah. What's your take on this future of the high street? I know you have some strong opinions. Uh, I do. Uh, I'll my work at Barker's Essence dovetails into my, the other thing that I do, I'm a director of the Academy of Urbanism. And for the last six years, I've been leading their program on high streets. So we, we have an awards event and I'm the lead assessor for, for the great streets. We have a long list of 10 streets down to a short list and we visit all three of them and spend a day in each of them. So we, we, uh, the Academy of Urbanism has a whole lot of data about high streets. Uh, as you say, at, at, at one end Regent Street or, or for example, last year, we, we visited Peck and Rye and saw some amazing things there. So I'm, I'm fascinated how they work. And uh, I'm a big fan of Mary Porter's. You know, Mary Porter said the high street was in trouble about eight years ago. And, and an article a few days ago, she's saying, everything that I said is coming true, but really, really fast. So uh, a, a couple of examples, uh, just where Regent Street meets Oxford Street, there was a, the, the old BHS, the British Home Stores uh, Department Store, when they went bankrupt, the, the owners said, there's no place for a traditional department store anymore. We've got enough in the West End. And uh, they did what I think is an amazing thing. They, they did a very cheap piece of stripping out uh, and then a, a very sort of funky, edgy 
fit out uh, and, and it's now called the West End Market Hall. So there's a couple of other market halls already in London and th this is an ad hoc arrangement. Uh, 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 it's almost like having food trucks parked in the old department store. So there's, so there's uh, different lo local businesses there. There's a, there's a TV studio uh, uh, to talk about food. There's a, there's a cookery school. There's four different event spaces. And it's, it's um, just before the lockdown, uh, me and people from my office were going there loads. You know, great food, fresh food, just an amazing place. And I, I think that's a really interesting model as, as the big shops struggle with, with, with to be relevant, how that actually works. Then on a on a more personal note, uh, when, when Trevor was talking about his market, where where I live, Belsize Park, uh, the farmers market was one of the first things to reopen after lockdown, and and uh, so it, it's been going a long time, but it, it reopened with actually ad, added bonuses. So you you go to the local school; it's their playground. They they get rent from the farmers market to rent it out all day Saturday. Uh, 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 one entrance into the playground, so social distancing was was controlled. There was a bit of a queue, but we were all enjoying chatting. And then you got proper fresh food, which uh, which, which come, comes from from the local area. So I think that uh, that that uh, that tradition or that sort of movement about farmers markets to be out in the open air, yes. socially distancing, buy, buying good fresh food is actually. In these in these difficult times is one of those sort of pleasures you should uh, you should be enjoying very interesting as setting it up in a playground um, there's one in Lewisham way which has been set up on a college car park every Saturday for many many years and you're absolutely right it's interesting that because the playground has a control you're almost absolutely. ready to go for the things that we're talking about the yeah. ins and the outs and the keeping the distance and the one-way systems Absolutely, yeah. That's an interesting one. Um, yeah, so any more thoughts about the, uh, you've talked about BHS sort of going from one end of the sort of one department store to the other end of as many, many, many different things as possible. What other futures do you think might be coming into our high streets? So, so, uh, so as you know, Liz, I was, I was asked to write something for the Journal of the London Society, which, which got published literally the week of lockdown. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm hoping that it's uh, I, even more relevant than when I started writing it. If you think about anywhere, and I'm just going to talk about the West End, but, but anywhere in any, any town, it, it's only 30, 40 years ago that, that shops were actually producing things. They, 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 they were making objects. They weren't just all about selling. It seems like a, a bit of a, a contradiction. But, you know, Covent Garden only closed in 1972. Uh, the, the, the reason that Carnaby Street be became so innovative in terms of fashion in the 60s and 70s is that the tailors were actually in the back streets of Soho. And uh, there, there, there's a great quote from, uh, from, from a Soho um, uh, let, letting agent just saying, it was, it was great in the 60s and 70s. People from the big department stores would go to Carnaby Street, uh, buy something, and then go to the next door street in Soho, and, and there were streets full of tailors making stuff. So, so I, I, I think there's a whole lot of opportunity with that. Tim, Tim's already mentioned the, the, those spaces where you can go and work, like co-working spaces. Uh, I've always been uh, an advocate of that idea about looking above the shops. There's so many empty, in any high street, there's so many empty floors above the shops. If we can just turn those into co-working spaces or, or anything like that. We, we did a great project in uh, Cam Camden Market a few years ago, the interchange there, where where uh, there, there was unused space above the very busy shops. It's now a co-working space for more than 900 people. A lot of those people are designers. They're, they're designing in the office space above, and uh, on the weekends, they're selling their stuff in the market stores below. So, so it's putting back that idea that, that you, it doesn't have to be that old-fashioned idea that the planners said, let's have zoning, shopping here, making here. Between 3D printing, new technologies it, it, um, making things doesn't have to be dirty and noisy and, and, and uh, polluting anymore and i and i think to be to have office spaces uh, uh, informal office spaces right in the middle of town above shops is a great idea and i think to be making things in the shops and, uh, and my final point about that is about is about growing things uh, i teach at the university of greenwich and and, uh, and and howard there has been talking about urban farming for more years than i can remember 
there's a chance to do that properly now. We we did a project for the Cordon Bleu where where uh, 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 cookery school where the whole of the roof is actually dedicated to growing vegetables. So when you when you eat a sandwich in the in the uh, cafe on the ground floor, it's only travelled from the roof down to there. All the all, all the herbs, all the salad leaves, or whatever, are grown above your head. And I think there's so much wasted space in any high street up above the main shops. There's a whole way that we can use that in a better way, and we should use this crisis. Uh, to make those things happen, e even if we just try it out as a as a prototype, let's let's do that now. Mm. I, I mean, I think um, in a way, all this stuff is ready to happen, and we can. We're actually doing an interesting project in um, Forest Hill High Street, which is my my local high street. Um, where we're converting what was a kind of um, off license kind of um, um, news agent into a um a shop and workshop for a watchmaker and we found out the going back to your point alistair that all this stuff happened quite recently that it used to be uh, a bicycle uh, manufacturer was based in that who made kind of quite high-end racing bikes in the 50s was based in that building um in that unit so um th th all these things are happening i think one you know that i think actually we just need the kind of um constraints to be loosened a little bit. I think the constraints are business rates, which are a big problem. Um, we're, we're based just behind the high street in East Dulwich, which is a very successful high street. And the business rates, if we were on the high street, our business rates would be crazy. Um, as it is, we don't pay any. So, um, but actually it would be quite nice to be there and have a sort of shop fund. Um, but we don't do it because of that. Um, and the other thing is the planning use. Um, the only way we could make the workshop feasible where we were doing it, it was be by having a kind of retail element so that we didn't have to change the change the, the use so um i think there's kind of there's some kind of kind of constraints um the, the other issue is is rent uh, and one the the, the the high streets that are successful like east dulwich is now suffering because all of the commercial landlords are pushing up their rents so high and it's pushing out a lot of the independent shops that kind of pioneered it um as a kind of really interesting high and varied high street. And they're now, uh, you know, there's been several examples recently, a great bakers that had set up um, and they've had to close up because their, their, their landlord quadrupled their rent. So, um, and we hear it and you just see a, a, a turnover and more and more chain shops coming into the, to the high street. So there's all the, I think what Alistair's is talking about, there's lots of people wanting to kind of come into the high street and kind of reinvent it or, or bring it back to some other kind of mix of uses. Um, but there are lots of things constraining that, um, which could be relatively easily solved by gov central government and local authorities. Interesting you say local authorities and central government. I worked on a silly little street which the council had five shops on, owned by themselves. We've now got them, three of them are a nursery, and the other two are a GP surgery. And persuading the council that this was a good thing took us nigh on two years, but we did it. <laughs> yeah. We did it. And they're so grateful we did it because they'd have been empty if they hadn't been yeah. that, That's such a great story, Liz. And I, I think it's that uh, uh, we, every day we read about people using the crisis to, to, to change people's minds. It's, it's, it's very much about the planning system, is all that old fashioned zoning. And um, even if we just said for the, for the next 12 months, let's 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 chuck away some of that zoning and actually have the more creative approach. I, I think the local authorities are, are actually up for change. We're, we're having quite a lot of planning meetings by by uh, um, by video links. And definitely the planners that I'm talking to seem to be more open to new ideas than they were even 10 weeks ago. So let so let's go for it. Let's let's persuade them to to break a, a few of the. <laughs> Do you think it's because they're working from home? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but 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 we we just it's been a I think it's been a spirit of we're all in this together. The planners are working from home. I, I, I found that as well. I mean, I, I spoke to one validation officer, and she said, "I've had to set up my desk on my ironing board." She said, "It's a novel experience," <laughs> and we we were just laughing so much about this that every time I got back to her, I was saying, "How's the ironing board bearing up under the strain yeah. of all your piles of work?" <laughs> 
yeah, it, 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 they have a much more human to human relationship. Exactly. It, it, it's easy to get into a rut with, with planners, you know, architects, developers, planners, we're all, you know, them and us. Some, somehow a video link from your, from your kitchen actually see, in my experience, is actually meaning we're having much more open conversations. Trevor. Yeah, so I was, I'm just going to say, Alistair, that um, as a developer and, and, and what that means in the planning process, I think the planning, um, uh, the planning regime is, is an aid insofar as it's a, it's a, it's a constraint and with a constraint means that values are underpinned. Um, so just going back to the high street, um, and I know, Tim, your particular high street quite well, because I live in the village, in Dulwich. Um, and you look at East Dulwich and um, you look at rents going up and you can see that some of the activities that were there before, yes, have to reassess whether this is the right place for them and other newer activity comes in. And that is a necessary part of how a high street, in fact, any entity should work over time. Um, so I see this kind of very complex situation whereby um, much more um, imagination needs to be um, so and used in order to make the high street work because it's not a simple or at least not from my vantage point it's not as simple as relaxing the planning it's not as simple as just allowing somebody that is just about economic to occupy a space and somehow that is in itself a good you know we have to be thinking much more um, than just that you know this is about making entities and locations sustainable and that is partly economics for sure that's partly constraint um, but that's partly having uses that are complementary i think you gave the example alistair of um, the west end in the 60s where you had um carnaby street as a shop window effectively department stores seeing a style that they could run with and then going to the artisans in Soho to get it made. And, and that was like a nice little circle that everybody could win. Um, we kind of moved away from that, whereby the multiples have the upper hand because they can afford to pay rents because their model works in that way where things are separated out. And we need to bring that together. So I, I agree with that. And we need to do that partly because um, if anything has been learnt or should be learnt in the last eight or nine weeks, that we have to be much more resilient. You know, and we're not. I mean, I'm hugely shocked at how um, our just-in-time system is just not fit for purpose. Um, and we have very little resilience. We are unable react to a sudden movement um, and to reposition or recast ourselves and that should be a huge concern and that's why I appeal to we should be having more imagination rather than just being caprice in terms of just reacting and saying it's a matter of just you know just relaxing planning or changing this because it's much more than how did you find your change of use from a cinema to um, to a housing? How was your experience in Brighton on that one? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think that's a good example, you know. So we have a quite a central spot just behind the North Lanes um, in Brighton on, on the main drag um, into central Brighton. And it was a lovely 1930s um, cinema. Um, last used in 1972, um, has gone through a number of hands, um, whereby the uses that they were hoping to get were just not sustainable. Uh, that meant the cinema itself was 
locked up and was in you know a no fit state because of being underused or not used at all for some 25 years and we came along and saw a vision of a residential complex there that would take advantage of the sort of streetscape it was in in front of victoria gardens um, and my vision was really to look at you know any of the london estates so let's take um Cadogan garden or Grosvenor estate and to see how they set up their squares and how the housing block which has that mansion block typology sits on the square sits in the streetscape and how it interacts and the only modern thing that we've done is to ensure that on the ground floor we have a active street frontage now we've the obvious option would have gone for um, as a retail and we said no and we've actually gone for a kind of more of a small hotel um set up where the general public come into the ground floor building obviously only up to a certain extent and can utilize that space in a um, hot desk in way co-working lounging uh, meeting friends um, all all the things that are convivial that would support artisans um, in a location like brighton i mean it is a very the um, town um, and then we've built um, 70 apartments around a courtyard um, and I have to say the planners were extremely pleased that we were able to bring a London concept to Brighton when they just hadn't had that exposure um, prior um, so Brighton planners were quite um, welcoming, weren't they? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, they, you know, they're very encouraging, and they um, applauded us for our vision. And again, that's where I go back to the idea of imagination. It's being able to see things not just as they are, but to go beyond and you know, and, and to have some envisioning. Um, um, aptitude so that um, you can you know sort of assess you know what might work here how would it work and and why and the reason why i use those sets of measures is is that everybody uses them but they use they use them from an economic perspective and i'm using them from a vision perspective because vision is, is of a higher order in hierarchy than economics um, and if you get it right, the economics will fall into place. And I think that's where some of the most successful uh, developers in the 20th century and the London estates, I must say, uh, Amaka Duggan, Grosvenor and, and the like, have been head and shoulders above the average um, developer. Well, I hope you're following in their footsteps now. Um, Alistair, you're... you're um... Next to the Crown Estate, I mean, it must be one of the biggest of these sort of estates. Do you think they're giving this vision leadership? Yes, uh, the Crown Estate has uh, it, it, uh, been our client for, for a number of years now. We, we've built many, many projects with them. I think uh, it, it's interesting. They they talk about being being a being a steward for the land. You know, they they've owned the land for two hundred years, and they're not they're, they're not going anywhere. So they're looking at the long term vision. So a few examples. Um, so, so as it happens, our, our, our landlords, the Crown Estate, we're, we're in Hedden Street. And uh, a few years ago, they introduced an idea that, that uh, all the office tenants can have a space on the roof to grow food. So again, when we have our office lunches, it's, uh, the tomatoes, the chilies, the, the peppers are coming from, from above our office, which is a fantastic thing. And the Crown Estate also a part of this uh, thing called the Wild West End. They're trying to make green roofs go all, all the way from Regents, Re Regents Park all the way down to to uh, to St James's Park, and uh, part of doing that, a lot of their buildings that we've worked on, we, they all have green roofs. A lot of them have beehives as well, so they're doing they're doing innovation in that point of view. 
we, we do a lot of offices for them. And uh, a, about a year ago, we opened uh, uh, an office, number one, Heaven Street, which actually, Trevor, interestingly, was an old cinema as well. It was a cinema in, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. The first time that Snow White was ever uh, played in London was, was in Heaven Street, in this cinema. Very good. So, they, so, so it, it was an office building, but, but in, in a, in a not, very, uh, not very clearly positioned. So the Crown Estate wanted to have the first co-working uh, on, on Regent Street. But they also set us an interesting challenge, which was to get the best possible well certification. And I was, I was really keen to use this opportunity to talk about well certification because it, it's this pretty simple checklist, but it's the things that all of us architects should be doing, but somehow, so, somehow has got lo lost in, it, in, in everything. So it's about uh, uh, view, views of green spaces, in, indoor planting, biophilia, uh, yeah. pro proper ventilation, a access to natural light, all, all those things that seem so obvious, but, but the Crown set us the challenge of, of uh, make, making that work. And uh, it, it, it's been a, a, a brilliant place. It got filled up very quickly. And, and now there's a whole thriving community there. We cut extra terraces in, into the space. So, it's, so it's, it, there's lots of open space. And then the people running it for the Crown have, have a whole program of other activities. It, it's a co-working space, but there's yoga every Wednesday. There's, a, there's, there's an event space that you can hire for your company. Uh, they, they, again, array, arrange group activities for our little street, for Head Street. So, and uh, what, what I think is going to be fascinating is the co-working model with people like we work seems to be about, about squeezing people in. It's about density. Yes. Now, it, that, that's going to have to change. Uh, and, and, you know, even today's paper is saying that we work are, are being criticised for, for just trying to still squeeze people in. I'm hoping, well I, well, I know that the project we've done with the Crown Estate, number one, Head and Street, actually has, because we've f followed all those well certification challenges, the adaption process should be um, still a challenge, but, but, but I think it's going to work because we, we've made so many open terraces, so many breakout spaces, this big event space me means that there's, that there's space built into the building, which can be used in different ways, which will help, help as we go back to work in terms of social distancing. Flexibility, 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 as we're all exactly. talking when we do our master plans. Exactly, yes. yes very We've good got about start. 10 minutes, I think, because we were quite slow to start. I know the last one we wanted to talk to ourselves, amongst ourselves, about was the challenge of adapting public spaces as we um, change. And I think, again, Alistair, you had some thoughts. We, we, we're looking at how... Um, Maybe the cycle routes that are temporary now, should they become more permanent and they're not just cones, but how would we dress the streets? I, yeah, I think this yeah. is a really interesting area to think about. So, so my, my first job in London was, was working for, for Terry Farrell a long time ago, 30 years ago. I was working around Charing Cross Station with, with, with Terry's project there. And, and they sent me into Villiers Street as the young graduate to ask all of the uh, restaurants and shops and bars if they'd like to have their street pedestrianised. And uh, it was a scary experience for a young graduate. Everyone uh, said, said uh, 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 definitely not. I got thrown out of a few restaurants. It was awful. But uh, bet between, between Terry and, and Westminster, they, they put a temporary no right turn on the top of Villiers Street for six months. They said, let's see what happens. At the end of six months, I had to do the survey again and every restaurant owner, every bar owner said, this is brilliant, why didn't we do it before? Can we have it please? So my, my, my training at Terry Farrell's, I was thrown into temp temporary road closure, pedestrian friendly streets. And that's a long time ago and I've never wavered from that. It's a great idea. So I'm really excited about what's happening. It just seems every day a new city says we're gonna have uh, more car free areas. And I'm just really excited. So, so then, then uh, it, for this temporary situation, we have Lots of people cycling, which is good, good for health. We have less pollution. We have lots of people walking to work. It seems brilliant. And if, if this crisis means we have to have lots of traffic cones and we give it a try for six months, nine months or whatever, I believe because of, because of Terry Farrell and uh, Villiers Street all those years ago, that, that some of those will become permanent. And that will be a great thing for all of our cities. Brilliant. Well, let's look forward to that. Um, what do you think, Tim? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, uh, that's, that's a particularly exciting aspect of what's happening. Um, and I think, um, I mean, everyone's talking about the fact that, you know, things aren't going to be the same again after the pandemic. And some of that can be overstated. Um, but the, just the mere fact that we've all had time to reflect. And I mean, in London, the difference in terms of air quality, in terms of noise pollution has been so profound. And I don't think there's anyone who hasn't kind of really enjoyed and appreciated um, the, 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 the change in the city uh, and also the kind of general reduction in traffic. And so it's a great opportunity to make some of those things more permanent and to press harder for those things to happen in the long term. So I think, you know, um, if we talk about the pandemic as being an, an accelerator of change, and then, and some people have talk, talked about it being a gateway to a different type of future, which again can be overstated. I think there's lots of things that will go back to kind of relative normality, but there's it just it does represent an incredible opportunity to reclaim some of the um, public spaces for pedestrians and and I think uh, yeah high streets as well need uh, um, there's an opportunity there for them to be as the kind of we've talked a bit about kind of central London but you know on a kind of local even within London within the periphery but in all the towns and villages of England the high street is the epicenter of the community and so um, that they, they, they need to be rethought um, and uh, reimagined. Right. And what do you think, Trevor? Do you think there are particular places that uh, lend themselves to a quick change, or do you think everywhere we're just going to have to struggle a bit harder? I, I, I think there are some easy wins. And um, I was just reflecting on, or while Tim was talking, when I was a graduate at Oxford, I did my diss on um, as conservation and land value. Um, and the upshot was that um, was conservation um, does lead and underpin um, good, strong land values. And I saw that in action again by studying the London Estates. And um, I'm just going back to what Alistair was saying that they regard themselves as stewards. Um, and I think if one of the advantages of being a, um, a modern day developer, you really have to understand the difference between being a long term um, um, developer um, driven by the vision as opposed to a developer on a short term driven by debt. Uh, because the two um, are not the same in terms of their outcomes. And you can see this in looking at the streetscape anywhere in Westminster where, where the Cadogan or, or uh, the Grosvenor State is or how the Walden, you know, you can see that there is deep, deep thinking of how we want this place to look and why we are wanting to conserve it. And I think, you know, modern um, local authorities could do well to look at that and to adopt some of that. And, and, and to understand what is it that makes our particular area local and, and special and to start with the high street, to start with those other um, areas where which are noted, where they can get some easy wins by having no right turns, as Alistair said, or having more cycle paths and, and just say no to the car. Great. So, um, summing up time, I think, really. Um, I don't know, is there one thing from each of the three of you that uh, we think we could take forward out of this seminar as um, what we could concentrate on each of us personally? Alistair, have you got a, a goal in mind? <laughs> well, I, I think um, my first observation is that if only all developers were like Trevor, we'd have a lot a lot better projects. I think it's a very refreshing thing to hear to hear that attitude. I know I know your Brighton scheme. I think it's a, it's great. And, and I think the, the bigger picture in that is that idea about uh, in this difficult situation, we don't have to follow the same models as we've been following for the last 30, 40 years. It's that thing that Trevor talks about, about having a vision 
and, and, and having a vision that we can drive forward and, and using this as a, as a catalyst for change. Fabulous. Tim, what are you going to take forward, do you think? Or is it a lot of things, including um, taking the dog for walks still? <laughs> I think um, I mean I think it's 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 a change. It's a time of change for um, individuals, for organisations. So it's an. I think I can see our own organisation changing. Um, you know, there's lessons to learn and there's kind of things to reflect on. Um, and also as a kind of enterprise, different things to focus on. So we're also going to spend more time looking at, at kind of ideas about uh, around our. Um, Kind of working from home, but also work at, like looking at the local community. I think five years ago, I did a I was part of a design charrette for Forest Hill, um, which led to some actual um, uh, action by by Lewisham um, in upgrading the public realm on the high street, and that was really positive. And so um, I think doing something like that again now would be really important. so getting the community together, thinking about what the high street can be, what can we do collectively to to kind of um, rethink it, uh, improve it. So um, yeah, lots to take out of it. Um, and yeah, I think it will be a time of change and we'll look back at it as a sort of, a sort of watershed um, moment in our lives. Trevor. Yes, um, I, I, I would just restate how important it is to have imagination. Um, I think, playing in the urban space, that's the key asset uh, that we should be holding on to. And um, something that hasn't been spoken about much, but we have alluded to it, is um, ESG. Just understanding that we can't look at that as a simple acronym and to just regard it as something as a nice to have. Uh, we should be using it in a very deep way as a, a tool that kind of sets up our thinking as to how we approach and how we work and play in the urban environment. Um, and if we're not doing that, then uh, you know, our level of resilience will uh, just remain poor. Um, and other things like um, how we've worked in the past in terms of if it's not making money or a certain amount of money, then we won't do it, or why should we change? All of that modeling, we need to break that down and we need to replace it with something else which is just as sustainable, just as viable, but engages, calls forth a greater level of resi um, resilience that we all need um, going forward because of course this won't be the last shock that we have and um, we need to be ready but we need to be ready in such a okay well I think on that resilience note Trevor Yes, yes, that's it. I think it is. It's, it's about resilience. Looking to the future, Tim. And um, keep up the good work, Alistair, I think. <laughs> we're, uh, we're going to come to the end of this particular seminar now, but I hope that everybody who watches it will enjoy it. And uh, it's been great to see you all. So bye for now. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Bye. Take care.